Learning to grow your own food is a valuable lesson. At one area college, they've taken that to a new level. We'll explain. And we tour a Duluth yard where a unique berm holds a bounty of beauty. Straight ahead on this edition of Great Gardening. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a Campanula, Campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello, welcome back, I'm Pamela Fish. Gardeners are feeling the excitement as the weather warms and that includes our resident experts, horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and Bending Birch's greenhouse owner Tom Casper. Now you two no doubt have been out working in the sunshine this week. Trying well, to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just your sunny disposition coming through? Is that why I'm thinking that? We're, we're all getting ready to go, but it's, yeah. we don't want to jump the gun. It's amazing. Remember last week we still had a lot of snow on the ground mm -hmm. and now things are beginning to melt. You know, Tom, it's kind of interesting. We always use kind of May 1st as a kickoff, and mm -hmm. even with all that snow in April, it kind of looks as if we're, we're looking at May 1st. Probably still be things. there. Yeah. yeah. So we're just about on schedule. All right, great. Well, our phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners are here, and they are ready to take your calls and get those garden questions to Bob and Tom for their sage advice. You can call the numbers there on your screen, locally 788-2844. We have a toll-free number for you. 877-307-8762 or email askgardening at wdse.org. Okay, here are this week's signs of the season. First, from Tana in Cloquet who found this little crocus popping out just this morning. And boy, it just does your heart good to see a bloom like this coming up in early spring. And you just want to say thank you, flower for showing yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Here are some crocuses that Tom grew in Duluth. Those have the variegated leaves on them. Those, yeah, those yeah, are really, really pretty. pretty fancy crocus. Mm -hmm. And buds of the maple trees are starting to show, coming to life. And then Bob, you shared um, some examples of ground conditions. Now, what are we seeing here? Well, again, you know, we came into last fall with uh, plenty of moisture in the soil, so we're really beginning to see some saturation. This was just two days ago, still seeing a little bit of snow being melted and uh, a lot of water just sitting. The frost is out, but that ground is so saturated. So this is one thing people are going to have to be aware of. You want to stay off those areas. Right. Action is your enemy. So let things dry down just a little bit before you get too aggressive. And to look at some emerging sprouts here. We have uh, the sprouts on the left and then on the right, the um, the cover. Yeah, this is uh, this garlic that's beginning to emerge, uh, planted last fall. And uh, one thing I've observed, that's a garlic bed on the right there, and uh, that was a, a good lofty layer of straw, and it, with all that heavy snowpack, uh, it's really been compressed. So people may want to get in there with a rake or something and just bring that back a bit and open it up because mm -hmm. there is quite a, quite a bit of compaction. If we knew how much snow we would get, we'd put the straw in a little lighter, and then, then uh, spring flowering bulbs as well as garlic will emerge on its own. But Here's some rhubarb growing in, uh, where was it, Tommy? That's the some? Chester Park neighborhood. Chester Park neighborhood, which brings us to another picture from a viewer. Kristen asks about this plant growing in the yard of her daughter and son-in-law's new house in the Twin Cities, and I think I can safely say it is rhubarb plants as well. Is that correct, guys? Yes. That's right. Those are the buds, and what people need to be aware of is those buds are vulnerable to deer damage, mm -hmm. and uh, once that damage occurs, of course, uh, you don't get the plant, but... Uh, Rhubarb does contain an acid, oxalic acid, they don't like, but at that point they will get in there and they'll... They like the fresh stuff. They like just the fresh young out. stuff, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, let's tackle just a, a couple more questions before we move on. Last week we were talking about nine bark and uh, someone said it's deer resistant, right? And we got kind of some mixed responses on that? You know, it's no different really than rhubarb. When those buds are beginning to emerge or through the winter months, uh, they are vulnerable to deer, but Tom, um, uh, as you pointed yeah, out. Yeah, as the season progresses, uh, the deer are less likely to uh, to dine on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nothing is, of course, completely resistant right. to deer, but uh, they do have a pretty good rec track record of being something that folks can plant with some good success. So. And I had this one from Sherry in Saginaw who said it's the fourth year since I planted my plum and apple trees, have had very few blossoms, uh, have had a few blossoms, but no fruit after four years. 
Plum and, and apple. Plum and apple. Yeah, we're, all, we're always concerned about having enough pollen. If it's one apple tree, uh, she wants to get a second one in, and probably a second uh, plum tree as well. And they're very immature as well, so I wouldn't be overly concerned after four years. I'd be a little surprised, except for some of the newer varieties that come into fruit uh, quite a bit earlier. But give us some time. In the meantime, let's get a couple more uh, trees planted. And we promised we'd touch on this. Uh, it's a problem that not everybody has, but someone had cattails that they wanted to get rid of. Mm. So, and that would take some chemical treatment, right? Well, you know, you always have options if you're willing to put on your hip boots and get in there and dig, right? <laughs> I mean, they really have a tough root. I've taken some out myself, and that's doable. Uh, there are, uh, there's at least one chemical control called Rodeo, which is an aquatic form of glyphosate or Roundup, and uh, that still has a label. So uh, you want to always follow that label and be, be very careful. But you have a couple of options there. Okay. All right, thanks for those responses. And uh, we have a lot more questions coming in, but we want to talk about how at Northland College in Ashland, they grow and market food that's used both on and off campus. Welcome, my name's Danny. My coworker is Sam, and we're the garden crew here on campus. So. What we do, um, it's our work study to take care of, plan, manage, and then market all of the produce that we produce here. And this is our permaculture production garden. It's where we grow most of the vegetables that we have, um, as well as we have a perennial garden closer to the center of campus. Uh, you may have seen it with the brick wall around it. So that has things like berries, rhubarb, asparagus, um, things like that that'll come back every year. Uh, so what we do is, we take care of the space and then we'll go to either the farmer's market in Ashland or go sell the chart wells in the cafeteria and then sell the outdoor orientation. My name is Todd Rothy and I am the manager of the Hewlings Rice Food Center here at Northland College in Ashland, Wisconsin. The campus gardens here at Northland College are 100% student initiatives. Um, we have a garden crew that's made up of, of students, of course, student volunteers and um, they, they do all the planning and organizing for the garden spaces. A lot of the food that's grown here is actually served in the cafeteria here at the college. So they actually get to eat this fresh, um, you know, um, superbly tasting, nutritious food. Orientation at Northern College is like none other around the nation. So our students actually get to go on camping trips and hiking trips, canoe trips, as part of their first experience here. And so what's happening today is our garden crew is making the vegetables available to the groups that are about to leave in the next day or two to go on their trips. Just come on up, uh, choose whatever you want, like choose each vegetable individually, start with maybe potatoes or zucchini, um, and then we'll weigh everything and record it. Potatoes? Cool. You should definitely take more. Did you want any kale or anything? There's more in the garden. We have two varieties of kale. We have like a green ruffly kale, um, and then we have like a red Russian, which is more of a purple variety. We've had really good success with a lot of greens. Uh, Napa cabbage was a huge hit um, at the farmer's market, and it went through with great success. We had kale, broccoli was, it was the first time for me growing broccoli, and that went really well. Being in the Schwamigan Bay, we, we have the lake effect. Um, which can boost, it gives us a zone boost of about half. The short growing season is probably the largest challenge and making sure you get as much diversity, I think, to your customers as possible. Well, really great program at Northland College and um, giving kids an idea about, you know, how to take care of themselves and feed themselves. Yeah, fun to see that younger generation yeah. getting interested. In, uh, indeed. Eating real food, growing your own. Yeah. Um, that's where it's at today. All right. Did you say growing your own? Growing your own. Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Bob did that in college too. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, is it too late to prune, <laughs> to prune limelight hydrangea? That's a question that no. we... Uh, no, uh, they want to take a look at that one and uh, make sure you don't have any flower buds there, but that one is going to bloom later in the year, so uh, they can prune it right Yeah, now. go right in and clean it up, do any kind mm -hmm. of shaping they want to do. 
Here's an interesting one um, from Carolyn in Superior. She said, my s yard is overrun with rabbits. It's been two years. Uh, we had a litter born under our deck. They seem to consider this home. What is a legal way to get them out of my yard? She said, I gave up on vegetables, but they eat everything. Hmm. And um, we did look that up. And of course, according to each state, they have rules and regulations and, and generally, you know, if they're creating a nuisance, you can get in there and take care of them in some way or another. Yeah, you want to check with your local municipality. Right. Sometimes there can be state laws, and then because of the density of people living together, the cities have their mm -hmm. own individual laws. You can always fence, and of course, um, there you have to be a little more careful because a chicken wire fence won't keep the rabbits out. You get smaller rabbits mm -hmm. get through that. So you want uh, hardware cloth, uh, smaller squares in there, and then. Uh, that will be the most dependable way. Also, some of the repellents, right, Tom? Yeah, liquid fence is labeled also for as a deer repellent. Uh, so, and I've used that with pretty good success. But however, if you do, you need to spray down along that base of those ah. plants where they're feeding, instead of just the tops where the deer might be feeding. So. And then I believe another active ingredient that you'll see is uh, thyram, which is actually a, uh, a fungicide. But you always want to be very careful, particularly if you're dealing with any kind of edibles. Uh, that you read that label very carefully. Uh, try different repellents, continually rotate them. But I still think in most cases, uh, people would be fencing and kind of nourish. If you have a red fox population, that's what, <laughs> that's what ultimately, uh, ultimately the controls way. the rabbits. All yes. right. Um, this question comes from Elena. And uh, she's wondering, is there a product that will kill weeds but not harm shrubs and other plants in the same area? Yeah, there's quite, uh, Bob had mentioned uh, glyphosate or Roundup is very effective. However, what she'd want to do is make sure she's shielding anything she doesn't want uh, to die or get sprayed. So using a piece of cardboard or, or rigid plastic or something like that to, to block that spray from hitting, she can go in and do a little bit of spot spraying or even using a paintbrush and dabbing that mm, and, and sure. dabbing the plant she wants. You know, that's good advice. Well, you have to be a little careful is there are some products that are that bleach in the soil, leach, and they, they are systemic. And uh, the one that comes to mind is dicamba, which is in many of the uh, weed control products. And even if you didn't have an overspray on the foliage, that can work its way down into the roots. So you want to be very cautious, and again, uh, those labels are there for your protection, and read that label very thor thoroughly. Okay, um, Marie in Duluth wants to know, when can I take straw mulch off my Minnesota mums? That's a good question. Um, again, they're breaking loose. Uh, you just don't want all that mulch. Uh, the danger of real cold is past, so you can start opening them up now for sure. And uh, you just don't want them to be deformed by the, he the heavy uh, straw layer that's out there. Take them off now, I think. Okay. Um, and when can I plant garlic? In the fall. Okay. I'll give you two dates on garlic. All right. It gets planted October 15th and it gets harvested August 15th. Mm -hmm. And just keep those two dates in mind. You got to pull the garlic out August 15th. You can plant in the spring, but you never really get much of a bulb. Sure. Uh, so it's a fall crop. All right. Um, let's see, one more before we move on. I have three different apple trees. This is from Greg in Duluth. Planted eight years ago in clay soil, no apple blossoms after eight years. Once again, you know, the interesting thing about clay soils, yes, if you're planting annuals or other things, everyone would like a beautiful sandy loam. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't have that. Clays for woodies, uh, meaning it, trees and shrubs, takes longer. They, they have to get established, but once they're established, they can be a tremendous soil base. I'm just saying he's got to give it more time. Yeah. Yeah, and depending on the variety, it could be a, on a standard rootstock, and, and a lot of those can take easily eight to ten years. Eight to ten to producing. twelve years sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, be patient, be patient. All right. Well, at a home in Duluth, they have built up a berm among their gardens that has proved to be comfortable quarters for all kinds of plants. Hi, I'm Bonnie Malter. This is my husband, Tom. We live uh, in Hunter's Park on Vermilion Road and uh, welcome to our garden. We've got some berm material and uh, I talked with a friend of mine. We delivered a large truckload of uh, silty soil. Uh, came from a drained lake bed. And uh, he said, this, this may do the trick. We like it a lot, uh, to our surprise. Uh, it contains lots of spores 
uh, mosses and liverwort. And once they were removed and then placed in a condition where it was more favorable for their growth, it just sprouted everywhere. And it really is a special environment. The most important uh, uh, characteristic of this soil is that it doesn't erode very easily and it didn't subside. We do fertilize in the same way that we do other plants. And then we have ground cover plants that also hold the soil in place to a great degree. This yellow uh, is called Lysimachia, or some people call it Creeping Gen Jenny. But you'll notice we really like that yellow color like, like we have here. Or um, this is called Scottish Moss. So you'll see how the, the blue in the fescula uh, contrasts with the yellow as well as the reddish color in the coral bells. There's three different clumps of grasses and uh, we like to have the property of the wind that'll just kind of gently move things about. There's three different trees. Mm -hmm. This one is called a yellow forsythia. The middle one is a nanking cherry and this is a amur maple. You'll see there's wrens going in and out of that birdhouse right here. We go to Florida in the winter and we got introduced to egrets and the larger birds and so that's where we, where we pick up our garden art often. These um, cannas are something that came from the farm where I grew up in central Minnesota many years ago, but every year Every member of our family plants cannas and we always have bulbs because we save them from year to year. I think this is Virginia creeper. Every year it uh, it's aggressively grows and so it uh, has the right uh, setting and I keep it trimmed so it roughly approximates the, the chimney. This is what we call our quilted rock garden. I am a quilter. And when I saw a picture of this in a gardening magazine, it immediately reminded me of a quilt. This is called Sagina, or again, it's the Irish moss. I have to trim it about once a month to keep it looking nice. Often quilts do have like a, a star or something showy in the center. So here we have a, a grass that'll get plumes that matches the ones that are up there on the deck. We like to be able to look out the window and see its beauty, so we like to see it from both directions. We're happy with it. That's an adorable corner lot, and I uh, just loved getting in there yeah. and seeing a, a great variety of stuff. They yeah, have. and a lot of people looking at that may say, may ask, how do they keep the deer out of that yard? And they are big um, fans. fans of the scarecrow, mm -hmm. uh, which is the motion sensor sprinkler that we've talked about, and that's gotten Bob a couple of times. <laughs> Keeps me out of the garden. And they said they've been out. using it for, for a number of years, and the deer have not gotten used to it, which yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, I think they're effective, uh, but water freezes at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good okay, for the uh, we have uh, more questions coming in. Mary from Scanlon wants to know, how many years will bulbs continue to bloom? She's talking about tulips, crocus, mm -hmm. scylla. Really, each of those has a has a pretty significant difference. Uh, tulips, most of them are hybrids, and they only last a few years before they start to fade. Crocuses and scylla can last for years and years, mm -hmm. um, and and spread, and the clump will get bigger over time. So easily 20 years on those, but the tulips maybe a couple of years. So it might be something she wants to replenish every couple of years, so. Okay, Shelby in Coleraine is seeking a soil recipe for container gardening. Okay, um, any number of materials are used and uh, you can start if you like with a packaged material. 
the, the thing um, that's important is you want a peat base to it and some good drainage. So I would say acid sphagnum peat moss, maybe a little lime to control the acidity, uh, vermiculite and perlite. These are probably the, uh, the key ingredients. And then, um, you know, there basically there's very little fertility, so any fertilizer source that you can use, you can use a slow-release nitrogen in there, a product like Osmocote. But you've got to, if you're coming over the top with fertility, you have to use water-soluble fertilizers that contain trace and micronutrients, not just mm -hmm. N, P, and K. So there's the key. Good drainage, near fertility, uh, or near pasteurized conditions so we don't have any pathogens or insects, and then managing your, uh, your fertility very carefully. All right, great, thanks. Mary from Cromwell says, if you nick an apple tree with a lawnmower, what can you do to help uh, the tree repair? Um, not nick it again, first of all. <laughs> um, certainly uh, mulching around that into the future, but really, ideally, if, if they've done damage, is, is hope that it heals from it, hope that the damage isn't too significant and that it will grow out of it. And unfortunately, if it is uh, a significant amount of the trunk of that tree or around the entire girth of the tree, it's, it's probably inevitable and will need to be replaced, so. Okay. You know, you might, you might do this, if Tom says, if people understand, a mulch area where we're actually taking the sod out and we're putting in wood chips, and you can go out as far as you want right to the drip line, and then there's less tendency to come in and, and hit it with a mower. The other thing, a small nick, just make sure you're not collecting water so you can take an exacto knife, box knife, cut that clean so that the water drains out of that area so we don't mm. get rot. And then it will heal in from the outside, smaller areas. But otherwise, sometimes it's better off just, as we say, prune at ground level and start again. <laughs> All right. Dennis from Evelith wants to know, can I grow strawberries in hanging baskets and what about the runners? Mm. Good question there because um, you definitely can. Uh, they're very useful, but you have to go with the day neutrals as opposed to the June bearing varieties. So some of the uh, uh, the most prolific varieties are June bearing. They run her like crazy. So you want to look at Tribute, TriStar. The big one out there right now is is one that actually came out of the Canadian breeding program called Albion, A-L-B-I-O-N. And Albion in uh, in a hanging basket will do real nicely for you. Less runnering in those. And they, they bloom and, and produce throughout the season. All right. Uh, Paula in Hermantown is looking for a flowering annual that does well in the sun and the shade. Well, a lot of them will do kind of mix, but certainly um, sun patients will do yeah. well, or uh, New Guinea patients are both good choices. Same family and um, ideal, and the and uh, mostly the deer will stay away from those as well. So. Great. The new impatiens at one time they they kind of bleed out in the sun, but they they're pretty good in sun shade yeah. or partial sun and shade. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, for this week's Grow and Show, we want to take you from Bovie, Minnesota to Herbster, Wisconsin. Mary and Rick Augustine await the return of the white lilacs at their gardens in Bovie. Last season, the fragrant shrubs served as a perch for some beautiful butterflies while in bloom. The delicate pink poppy fits comfortably in this woodland setting where later in the season, the rocket Ligularia shoots its yellow blossoms skyward. Colleen Green grows a gorgeous bright magenta hibiscus in her gardens in Herbster. That's where she also brought these vibrant red nasturtiums to bloom. Her Cleome shows its contrasting colors of lightest and bright pink petals, while the sturdy stalks of this vivid sunflower support its heavy heads of flowers as they tip toward the sun. If you have pictures of flowers and fine foliage to share, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org. All right, uh, time for just a few more questions. And, and please keep those pictures coming in. Those are beautiful. We love, we love to see them from all over the area. Dan from Duluth is wondering, can a larkspur be divided and what time of year is good? Sure, uh, the delphinium and uh, spring is a perfect time as it's coming up. You can get in if the clump is nice and big and just uh, go at it and you should be able to get 10, 12 plants out of a clump like that and they will be just fine. Nice, all right. Liz from Woodland wants to know what kind of organic fertilizer can I apply to my lawn and how, sh how should it be applied? Oh, that that's really a good question. Uh, 
You know, I have my biases toward uh, animal-based organics, mm -hmm. and there is a product, since we're using name brand, called Sustain, which is a Minnesota product. It's turkey manure, and you can spread it lightly over the top. Another option is, is to rent a plug aerifier, where you actually pull cores of soil out and then drag that organic material over the top so it fills some of those holes that are left, and then you get some down in the root zone, which will da gradually feed through the entire season. Okay, great. Um, well, I want to show you this. This is one of our area big box stores selling apple trees, and apparently they have a good sense of humor. They're calling them deer snacks. How about <laughs> that? I fail to see the humor in that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that uh, since we've had so many apple questions, you really want to be careful about varieties, be right. careful about your supplier. Remember, this is a tree that's going to last and produce for 40 or 50 or 60 years and you want to make sure you buy very high quality stock and not necessarily just look at the price. Okay. But if you really are just into feeding those lovely deer, it doesn't matter <laughs> what you plan, right? That's right. <laughs> and go cheap. <laughs> and go cheap. <laughs> All right, we also want to let folks know we still have tickets for that fabulous garden bus tour to Bayfield and Madeline Island. And we have moved the date back to June 3rd when uh, we're sure to see more blooms. So we hope more people can join us. Go to our website for more on that. It's wdse.org slash gardening. And that is a great trip. We're going across the bay again to Madeline yes, Island. Yes, yes, taking right? the Madeline Island ferry across so we get uh, a little adventure along the way. It's It's been a lot of fun. And that's when Bayfield in Bloom is going on. And um, they really love to celebrate their, their spring flowers, their apple blossoms. And it does get very gorgeous out that way. Mm -hmm. Fun trip. Yeah, it is. It is. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have for this week. We do want to say thank you to the St. Louis County Master Gardeners for answering the phones. And, of course, thanks to you, Bob and Tom, for providing the answers to all these questions. Uh, great information, as always. And we want to say thank you to all of you out there watching. Thanks for calling in with your questions. And we hope to see you back here next week for another edition of Great Gardening. Until then, enjoy the garden. Thank you.